Welcome to another RetroNAS video. Today we're going to look at the Sony PlayStation 2 and how it can then connect to an SMB share via the OpenPS2 Loader Homebrew software. Uh, it'll let you stream your games from RetroNAS uh, and give you access to some pretty cool functionality. Alrighty, as always we uh, jump on our Raspberry Pi and run RetroNAS. Uh, head to our install things and from here we're going to choose to install the Sony PS2 Open PS2 Loader config. Now uh, if you've already installed Samba that's fine. If you haven't installed Samba this will do it for you. It'll figure that out as a prerequisite and get that done. Uh, so it doesn't really matter whether you manually install it or just let the installer take over but we'll do that now. Okay, that's all done. Uh, now, if you haven't done this already, uh, you will need to set the SMB password separately to the system password. Uh, if you have done it, you can do it again. Um, doesn't hurt. So we go to configure RetroNAS password. Say yes to the prompt. It'll ask us for the system password. Uh, so that is the password that we SSH on to the system with. And then it'll ask us for the SMB password. So I've done this before in other videos, uh, but I'll redo it here just to sort of uh, reinforce the point. Uh, I'm making my my system username is Pi, which is the default Raspberry Pi user, uh, and I'm making the password Pi. Okay, all done. So let's have a look what that looks like. So here's our uh, retro SMB share that we've logged on to previously. Uh, now there's a bunch of garbage in here because I've been doing other videos and I've been testing things so um, a lot of tools will start filling up my retro SMB location. Uh, if you watch any of my SMB, Samba or Net Talk videos you'll see me doing Mac stuff in here as well. Uh, but now there's a new share that's popped up called PS2 so let's have a look at that. Inside there will be Open PS2 Loader, uh, so you can put other things in this top level if you want, that doesn't hurt, but this Open PS2 Loader, everything below here um, has a very specific setup, so let's have a look at that. Uh, now all of these are created by RetroNAS, uh, they all need to be uppercase and they all need to be spelled in the way that they're spelled. This is very specific to how OpenPS2 Loader works. Uh, and now within these you have to put specific things. Uh, so you're, I cover all this in the wiki, go through exactly what all these are. The really important ones I guess straight away for actually playing games are CD and DVD. So if you've got a game that is a CD based game, so PlayStation 2, I'm not sure about the exact percentage, if I had to guess, I'd probably say only about 5% of games uh, were on CD format. Definitely the vast majority of games on, on PlayStation 2 were published in DVD format. And you can usually tell, CDs are sort of 700-ish megabytes or below uh, when you rip the ISO, and we'll go through that process. We'll rip an ISO so you can see what that looks like. Uh, and DVDs, somewhere between, um, I've seen them as small as sort of a, a gigabyte, um, and then the, the DVD upper bounds of that format are 4.7 gigabytes for a single layer DVD and 9 point something for a dual layer. Um, so generally they're sort of the size of DVD games. It does vary about on 
how much data is actually on the disk. Uh, these other things you can use them if you like. Um, the wiki sort of goes into detail. Some interesting ones, I guess. Apps are where you put your uh, ELF files if you want to run them, or Homebrew applications. Anything that the that the PlayStation 2 can run that's not like a, a disk image. Artwork goes in the art directory. CFGs for configuration. Cheats go in the, the CHT directory. Language files and the LNG. Uh, that's a special folder for Popstarter, which is the PlayStation 1, I guess, hypervisor or whatever, the, the system that lets you play PlayStation 1 games on a PlayStation 2, but through Network Boot. I won't go into how to do that today. There's a bit of complexity around how you set that up. Um, I might do another video on that in the future. Uh, THM, I'm not sure. I think they're thumbnail files for the um, for the artwork. Uh, and then VMC are your virtual memory cards. So uh, OpenPS2 Loader has an option to not use a real physical memory card, and you can instead create a virtual memory card per game. Uh, that's really cool. You can then uh, share your memory cards with emulators or with friends if you want to uh, grab their saves and see where they are in a game or if you know, you've know got a, a game that you can't get past a certain thing and you want to load a, load a save in to get past it or whatever. And you know, backing up your own saves too. So if you want to play some epic RPG um, and you want to save that, that memory card, you can do that. That's pretty cool. But that's kind of the loadout. Uh, of uh, where things go, what we'll do now is we'll actually rip a genuine PlayStation 2 game uh, off a disc and we'll put it in the right place and then after that we'll get on a real PlayStation 2, we'll load up uh, OpenPS2 Loader or OPL and we'll see how that looks. Okay, so to start with, I'm um, heading to redump.org. Redump are a preservation group that specialise in optical media. Uh, they don't do ROMs and cartridges and things like that. They only do uh, ISOs or bin queues or things coming off uh, CD, DVD, UMD, any of the or GD-ROM, any of the optical discs uh, across you know huge amounts of computing and console gaming. Um, and what they do publicly is they store the checksums and all the vital information uh, about the discs and the individual revisions uh, and that's really cool because you can you can do two things number one um, you can use that to reference particular games and number two if you do a dump of a game you can then verify your dump against their database to make sure that uh, a you haven't screwed something up in your dumping process or b you don't have a damaged disc uh, and that's really, really cool. Uh, they do amazing work for preservation, and I, I think they're absolute heroes. But they also uh, make some tools that you can do things for yourself. So let's have a look at that uh, right now. So I'm head to the guide section of their website. Uh, in here, there's a whole bunch of uh, dumping guides. Now, some consoles require you to dump things in a very specific way. For example, if you've got a, a Wii, you need to load some software on the Wii to actually do the dump directly. Uh, Microsoft consoles have some weirdness about them unless you can uh, flash an actual DVD-ROM disc with special firmware. It's, it's quite difficult to dump their games. Um, but thankfully, the old PlayStation 2 is pretty bog standard in the way that it does things. Um, there is some copy protection on things, but these guys have released uh, some software that can handle that. So I'm going to click on this disc dumping, dumping guide here. This is uh, the list of things that this particular tool can dump. There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, um, if you dig through the list, you can see, uh, you know, Atari Jaguar, Neo Geo CD-ROM, Sega CD, Mega CD, PC Engine, Turbo Graphics, uh, generic PC, Mac, all sorts of things. So lots of ways to get uh, your old disks backed up. Now, pretty critical, if you do have a lot of optical drives lying around, back them up. They do not last forever. Uh, have a copy somewhere, back that copy up. Vital that these things get preserved. Anyway, let's jump into the dumping guide. Uh, now in here is a lot of text, um, but the critical bits you want are the actual software. So uh, the Microsoft.NET Framework and Visual C re Redistributables, I've already installed those, so I'm not going to go and do that today. Uh, but just click through the links, grab the uh, files from Microsoft.com and install them. They're the bits needed to actually run the tool. Um, so this uh, DICUI is what it used to be called. Now it's called MPF. I think it's Media Preservation Framework. If you click on that, It'll take you to their GitHub, and we can grab the latest release. 
Um, so let's grab that. I'm just going to grab this MPF22 here. Uh, and I'm going to stick that in. I've got a directory for this. I'm going to put that there. Okay, extract it. Alrighty, now I'm going to uh, pop my physical disk in the drive. Let that spin up. Okay, there we go. Find the mpf.exe and run that. Now it's uh, scanned the drive and it's automatically found uh, that it's a PlayStation 2 disc, which is really cool. Uh, it also manages to extract the name out of the header uh, of the drive. Uh, you can rename it anything you like, of course. Um, if you click on the drop down here, you can just see this, the insane amount of stuff that, that this tool supports across all the different formats. I mean, I'm even seeing like um, arcade stuff where you know games get distributed on, on CD um, to the actual arcade hardware, you know, there'll be a security dongle or something to go with it, but you can still rip those, which is really good. And they'll, they'll work if there's security bypass tools like MAME and those sorts of things. Um, here we can see the PlayStation 2, again, the CD-ROM or DVD-ROM format. This one is detected as a DVD-ROM, which is pretty cool. Uh, automatically picks up my drive letter, the speed that the drive offers, uh, and simply is just a one-click dump. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, what I'll do is you'll see this start to dump, but then I'll quick cut to the end. It does take a little while. You can see this pop up. Uh, it'll start dumping in a sec once it's figured out a few things about the drive. And off it goes. And it's, it's measuring the uh, number of sectors that it's dumping. Uh, so again, I'll cut to the end of this so you don't have to sit there and watch this boring thing tick all the way up. Okay, coming up on the end of these here. Uh, now it's going to hash the different bits. So it's going to generate a like a checksum, a digital fingerprint of that uh, game ISO. Uh, and we can use that for verification. I'll show you a pretty quick way to do that in a second. Bit of a cheat way. Okay, uh, there was a big obnoxious loud sound there. Uh, and we're done. Okay, let's check out, oh, uh, once you've done the actual ripping, uh, you can put a whole bunch of information in here if you want. Uh, now this is good if you want to uh, upload stuff to Redump. So if you're a member of Redump, you've got to go through a process to join up. Uh, but if you want to upload, not the not the ISO itself, not the copyright part, but all the uh, metadata, the hashes and all that kind of stuff, you can fill all this out. Um, there's a guide to the, what they call the ring code, which is the um, inside the optical drive. There's a really tiny little plastic bit just where it sort of clips into the drive. Um, and you can see in there a bit of text that you've got to read and, and write down, obviously, because this thing can't rip that. It's printed on the actual media. Uh, yeah, so you can put all sorts of stuff here if you like. Uh, because I'm not submitting this, I'm just going to hit accept. I don't care about any of this information myself just to play the game. All right, let's check out what that looks like. Um, so it's created an ISO directory here. Uh, there's my Okami. So this is the bit I care about. This ISO file is 3.3-ish, 3.3 uh, 3 .3 on disk, but uh, when you round down powers of 2, 3.15 gigabytes. So uh, straight away you can tell it's a DVD image just because it's greater than the 750 meg max of a CD-ROM. Uh, and also I can tell that it's a single layer, so it's, it's lower than the 4.7 uh, limit. Now what you can do too, is check out this. This is the uh, submission information. This has all the information about the file, um, all the little interesting bits, and it's got the hash down the bottom. So if you want a cool trick, I like to grab the SHA-1 and then head over to a browser and simply punch the SHA-1 into the browser. And often you will find the Redump uh, database information for that particular game. So my SHA one's matched uh, and it's told me here it is a DVD5 uh, region Euro so I'm in a PAL territory uh, this is a PAL game that I've I've bought here uh, and it's matched the SHA one so straight away I can tell that I've got a good dump if I didn't have a good dump uh, this SHA one would be completely wrong so that's really good that at least says to me uh, that the process that I've followed in dumping the game is pretty good.
All right, now one other test you can do before we jump on a real PlayStation, um, you don't have to do this of course, but this is pretty cool. I've got my dumped Akami game here. I'm going to drop that straight on PCSX2. Uh, this is a emulator for PlayStation 2. It's a really good emulator. They seem to be doing a lot of great work. Um, I don't know what buttons I've got bound. There we go. Set that to 60 hertz mode and then fire off the game. And as a pretty good test, you can just see whether or not this runs in an emulator. So this is working pretty well. All right, it's working great. Um, so you probably noticed straight away there that there was a lot of uh, video in the opening sequence, and that's really good. We're going to test this on a real PlayStation 2, uh, and in particular, streaming video is quite troubling uh, for games that want to load up off USB or um, any sort of uh, interface into PlayStation 2s that's quite slow with their USB 1.1 ports. Uh, so it'll be a good comparison for us to see whether or not this Raspberry Pi can push fast enough information over the network uh, to the PlayStation 2. So I should mention too, I've got a uh, fat PlayStation 2 running free McBoot. Uh, it's got a, an official Sony network adapter in it. It's got a hard drive in it too, but I, I don't like using the hard drive. It's quite uh, clunky. You have to pull the hard drive out and uh, write things in a specific way to the disk. It's not sort of a drag and drop process. So the I find the networking a lot easier. Um, worth noting that the, the network adapters that you'll buy off AliExpress or eBay or whatever, they're not actually network adapters. They're just hard drive adapters. The network port is empty and it doesn't have anything in it. So that's a bit of a bummer. Um, but if you've got a place PlayStation 2 Slim, they're excellent. They have a, a Ethernet port built into the hardware model itself. If you've got one that can run any of the exploits like Free McBoot or DVD Boot or whatever, whatever's out there these days, there's more and more of these things popping up all the time. Uh, they're a great choice to run this software. Uh, and of course, they're quite slim and they're quite quiet. Um, you'll probably hear mine when I film it in a sec. Um, sounds like a jet engine taking off because I've got a, a, a replacement fan in there that's quite loud. I should replace that at some point with a, a quieter one. Anywho, uh, we'll get on the real hardware and we'll see what that looks like. But of course, uh, before I do that, I actually have to uh, copy the game across. So let's do that. Right, so here's my uh, retro SMB. I'm just going to double click in the DVD share here and drag my dumped ISO over there. Once that's copied, um, I'm sadly on a, a Wi-Fi connection on the other side of my house, so it's a bit slow. Um, much, much, much faster if you do this over wide ethernet, of course. Uh, but once that's copied across, uh, we'll jump on the PlayStation and we'll check out what that looks like. Okay, so firing up the PlayStation 2 with Free McBoot. Um, I won't go into the, the details of how to install Free McBoot. I think there's a, a bunch of great channels out there that, that uh, explain it all. Um, you can obviously put things in your menu here, uh, like uh, OPL2, uh, but I won't go into that either. I'll just go into Ulaunch Elf, which is the um, Elf's, Elf's are the, uh, the PlayStation 2 binary format. Uh, so you Ulaunch lets you launch them, which is cool. Um, I'm going to go to my memory card. I've got some OPL settings here, some Open PS2 Loader settings, and I'll delete those just so we are absolutely fresh and clean. There we go. Um, and just I've stuck a USB stick in here with the latest OPL, fresh off uh, GitHub. Um, you can copy that to your memory card to launch it off your memory card or launch it, launch it from the hard drive or whatever. I'm just going to launch it straight off the USB stick. Um, just because it's here. Okay, and once we're in OPL, now I'm uh, just pointing a crappy uh, phone camera at my CRT. I don't have any capture stuff on hand to capture this, so it's all going to look a bit ugly and a bit jittery. Um, obviously, it'll look normal to you. That you can just probably see the interlacing freaking out my uh, my camera a bit, especially in, I'm in a PAL territory, so it's all 50 hertz. Uh, however, uh, let's do this. Let's go into the network settings of our uh, OPL2. 
setup. Um, I uh, configure mine via DHCP, so if you've got a DHCP server in your house, you can tell OPL to just pull the IP address settings from that. That's what I'm doing here. Um, otherwise, you can just change that to be static if you like and set it statically. I'm going to leave mine as DHCP, nice and auto. Your SMB server, so this is what points back to RetroNAS. Um, now, you can tell it to look up the SMB server two different ways. You can use NetBIOS or you can put in the IP. Uh, I'm going to use NetBIOS. Uh, RetroNAS advertises itself via NetBIOS. It's an older way of, of uh, pushing names across a network. These days, it's not so recommended. But again, RetroNAS is retro, so we do things the retro way. Uh, the address here is just going to be Retro SMB. And just press Start to apply that. So it's going to find that on the network, which is nice. Uh, the share name is PS2. Username Pi, and again, you know, you can config. Oops, you can configure this to be anything you want. These are the defaults I use for all my demo videos. Password Pi. There we go. Uh, so once all that's in place, we just hit OK. Uh, I also like to go into the main settings. Uh, you will need to turn e uh, ETH mode on. Uh, so that means every time OPL starts, uh, it'll go looking for the Ethernet stuff. Uh, and then your default value, likewise, you can set to whatever you like. I'm going to set mine to ETH games. And then I'm going to run down here to save changes. So that'll write it back to um, the memory card, the PlayStation memory card. Uh, it'll create that little OPL folder and write that there. Uh, so then once you're good, just exit out of there, exit to browser, yes. Okay. Uh, and there we go. So straight away, it's picked up my SMB share. So that's now the default um, menu item for OPL. And you can see there, I've got a Kami uh, as the first one. So that's, you can name it whatever you like. Um, in older versions of OPL, you had to call it the serial number. So you see down the, um, down the bottom there, it's got that SLES and then a serial number. Um, so the, the ES means it's a uh, European one. I think if it's US, it's a, an American one. Uh, I'm not sure what the, the uh, Japanese one's sharp has. But anyway, the Okami there up the top left is uh, pulled out of the, um, the file name. Uh, might even be pulled out of the title of the disk too. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, so I think you can, if you rename that on disk, it should, um, on, on, um, in your share, it should pick it up there. Anyway, so let's launch that. We're just going to hit the... Oh, uh, one other thing you can do before I jump into that is you can go to Network Update uh, and you can turn that to Overwrite. So what this will do, I think, uh, is it goes and grabs um, all of the like compatibility modes and settings and things like that. So if there's some, something weird about your game where it needs some special settings in terms of how it works, um, it can go and pull that information down as well which makes uh, configuration a little bit easier. Uh, if I look at my options here with my triangle button, uh, you can go into like game settings and you can change all sorts of modes and things like that. They're all uh, things that help if the game doesn't want to launch. Again, I'm not going to change any of that. I'll just I'll pull down those network settings and that should hopefully uh, automatically configure all that. Anyway, let's get into it. Let's launch it. It's going to load that config that it downloaded. And it's going to run the game. So this is all. This is pulling the game uh, straight off OPL two off the RetroNAS device. There we go. So now it's asking me for. I've got the European release of this game, so I've got some different languages I can choose. I'll choose English. Um, I can change my uh, video mode PAL NTSC. Uh, I might try that. I'll see what happens if I set it to NTSC. Hoping it won't freak out my camera too much. I'll just set that now. Right, there we go. Camera's in 60 hertz mode. So hopefully that'll be a bit smoother for uh, for YouTube. All right, let's go. Now, the reason I've chosen this game is that the intro is almost entirely uh, video. So one of the things about loading PlayStation 2 games off the off USB sticks or something like that is that the... Um, the video is often really choppy, so we'll see here whether how the video goes straight off the network.
So it looks pretty smooth, it's pretty good. No dropping frames or anything like that. Might take a look at the network traffic uh, from inside the Raspberry Pi's point of view uh, and see how that goes. Uh, but otherwise everything's loadable, game loads up as normal. Hit my start button. More or less loads the same speed as a, a CD-ROM game, not, not any faster, not any slower. Unfortunately there's a lot of video uh, at the beginning of this, kind of a lot of unskippable stuff so I can't get into gameplay. Um, however, I mean I have played this game through to completion this way, um, but don't have my save handy unfortunately to load that up, uh, but this works really well. So that's looking really good, pretty much load up any games you like and uh, off you go. Okay, so uh, it's kind of interesting to see what the PlayStation 2 is actually doing uh, from a network perspective. So I'm on my Raspberry Pi now. Now, none of this I'm doing you have to do. This is just kind of an FYI at the end uh, if you're interested in the technical side of it. Um, Samba supplies a tool called SMB status. Um, and if I run that with the double V flag for very verbose, it will tell me a whole bunch of output about what's going on. Uh, there's a couple of parameters here that I've got I've got to look into as to, I think I've got some client and not client uh, config uh, around the wrong way in my SMB config, but that's okay, it doesn't affect anything for the moment. Um, but what we can see more interestingly are all the connections. So we can see two systems connected, um, there's currently two connections coming from this uh, this IP address here, uh, and there's one connection coming from here. Now, some of the interesting things about these connections are the protocol versions. So this machine is my laptop that I'm sitting on right now recording this video from. I've got the uh, share open, um, and I was just browsing around in the share, and you can see that that's coming at SMB3, and the latest version of SMB3 at time of uh, this video being recorded is SMB3.11. Uh, that's the version of the protocol used by the latest patches of Windows 10 and Windows 11 and the latest version of the protocol that Samba 4 also supports. You can see here I've got Samba 4.13 installed. That's what uh, the RetroNAS installer does uh, for us. Um, yeah, so this is a very new system. We've got some partial uh, packet signing going on as well, some security stuff built into SMB. Now, uh, NT1, that's SMB1, uh, that's a deprecated format. If you've got a Windows 10 or Windows 11 uh, workstation or laptop and you try and share files out of that, by default it will stop SMB1 from working. There's a lot of security problems with SMB1. Um, and if you've, if you've read the wiki or any of the install documentation I've got with RetroNAS, you'll see that I warn people quite a bit about uh, the security implications of running RetroNAS. Um, you know, we are sharing out to very old systems, uh, so they're going to have old protocols and they're going to be quite insecure. One of the downsides to that is things like Samba 4, Windows 10, these are now shipping, turning off these old insecure protocols, which is a good thing, mind you, for most people. For us as retro gamers, it kind of sucks. So RetroNAS goes and enables all of these old protocols. If you watch the SMB Samba video that I recorded, you'll see in that um, that I've gone and enabled all the way back to Landman um, and very old versions, NTLM um, versions of SMB and CIFS, uh, which make it a lot more compatible with older systems. So uh, free McBoot running OpenPS2 loader by default wants to connect with NT1 or SMB1, um, which normally Samba will block, RetroNAS has turned that on for you. That's the whole sort of moral of the story, I guess. And we can follow the uh, process to see what's going on. So we can see which bits have got what open. Uh, this process ID here and this process ID here. Uh, we can see that they have in read only mode open the ISO. So we can actually tell that that machine is connecting in, uh, grabbing that I ISO file and reading it. Two processes normally mean that there's, you know, uh, one's doing metadata and one's reading chunks, or they're splitting the load between them, or whatever. That's all kind of normal. Um, so let's see what that's actually doing. If we do this.
Okay, so what I've done here, um, I've installed a bit of software called IFTOP. It's going to give us a real-time readout of uh, the networking information going on inside the Raspberry Pi. It works with any Linux system. Um, I've told it to look at any interface. I don't care what the interface is. Tell me what's going on. A couple of flags here. So little p, I believe, is promiscuous mode. That allows it to see any information being forwarded from one interface to another. Uh, capital P, I think, tells me the individual ports, so not by IP, but by port as well. Um, now, I forget which of the little n and which of the big n is which, but they, they essentially don't try to do DNS lookups on um, either the port numbers or the IP addresses. It just gives me raw port information, so it just makes everything numerical. Uh, and then I'm putting on a filter there, and I'm going to filter by this host, this 192.168.3.170. On my network, that is currently my PlayStation 2 IP as dished out by DHCP. So let's have a look at that. So we can see straight away uh, the information that's passing back and forth. We can see the RetroNAS device here uh, listening on port 445. So that's the standard SMB port. Uh, and then we can see the PlayStation 2 uh, has created its own sort of higher level port uh, and it's pulling information into that port. Now, how fast is it doing that? Well, that really depends on what's going on. I've got the PlayStation 2 running currently, obviously, um, and it's just in the sort of the attract mode of Okami. Um, now, you remember there's a lot of uh, video in there. So this is going to give us sort of some insight into the streaming rates that's going on for real-time video. Now, um, obviously, the this is all in megabit, kilobit and megabit. Um, the PlayStation 2 itself can physically connect at 100 megabit. Uh, now, the fact that it does and can connect at that does not necessarily mean that that's what you're going to get all the time. Uh, the transfer rates are really going to be dependent on a couple of things. Number one, what the PlayStation needs at any given point in time. Remembering that the PlayStation 2 has very a uh, small amount of RAM. Uh, I think it's like four to eight megabytes or something in that range. I'd have to look it up to, to verify. Um, so it's, it's not going to be, you know, pulling in huge gobs of data. The other thing is that with streaming video, it's going to be wanting to simulate that effect of streaming that video real time. Um, so you can see here, it barely ever gets up to 10 megabit, which is kind of interesting. Now, um, USB 1.1, which is the limiting speed factor of the physical ports in the PlayStation itself, uh, skips when you try and, and read video. And that comes down to two factors. Number one, the limiting speed of USB 1.1 itself, which is very low. And then number two, often USB 1.1 flash media itself is quite slow. Um, so, you know, we'd have to do some more tests, I think, uh, on seeing actual loading times of levels and things like that. I might try and do some of those uh, later in a, in a future video just to try and get a feel for it. Um, however, the other thing is the, the actual drivers built into OpenPS2 Loader uh, as well as the, the way it simulates the virtual CD-ROM back to the PlayStation 2. That's all going to be capped a little bit um, you know, there are a number of games that if they get data too fast, things break, and you can you can see that in emulators. If you run PCSX2 and you turn up the virtual CD-ROM speed too high, some games are fine, they'll load very, very quickly, uh, some will just break. So I think um, Free McBoot, not Free McBoot, OpenPS2 Loader by default tends to cap that back a little bit. But not a huge deal. Um, from my, I guess, uh, anecdotal experience, loading times are definitely the same or better than a real disc. Certainly uh, there are games where the on-disc layout is really poorly optimized and you can hear the, the optical drive head whizzing back and forth making a racket as it's trying to find different sectors. Those sorts of games, um, Neo Geo Battle Coliseum is one that comes to mind. That's terrible, terrible load times on a PlayStation 2. Um, this feels a little bit faster. That seek time is greatly reduced because of the virtual CD-ROM that's sitting on storage. Uh, but for the most part, I think it's it's pretty much the same. It's the same or better from my experience uh, using the SMB tool. Certainly not worse, and that's what we care about. Um, USB is, is pretty terrible. Hard drive options are great, but getting games on the hard drive dynamically are kind of a pain in the butt. 
um, using SMB, you've got to go through the hassle of setting up the network and all that kind of stuff. RetroNAS automates the uh, server side for you, configures all the protocols and everything, so that's nice and easy. Um, dumping games and dropping games via an SMB share and having them ready to go on your PlayStation, that's really cool, uh, as is being able to throw heaps and heaps and heaps of uh, really big hard disk at your NAS um, and having almost unlimited storage. You could probably hold the whole PlayStation library these days with hard drives that are available. Um, put a couple of those together in, a, in an array and you've got a pretty great storage option if you want a complete PlayStation 2 library. Not only that, you can share them amongst multiple PlayStation 2s. If you wanted to have uh, some sort of museum set up or you wanted to have a, a party with a bunch of different PlayStation 2s, not a bad option here um, to be able to have multiple PlayStation 2s fed off the same physical network uh, without having to go and do uh, drive loads and, drive and disk swaps and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, that's it for the uh, PlayStation 2 Open PS2 Loader video. Hopefully this gives you another option to play your PlayStation 2, um, experience maybe some games that you haven't experienced, or play your favourites again. Uh, certainly back up your existing games, uh, prevent any sort of uh, damage to the drives. Maybe even re revive an old PlayStation 2 if you've got one where the, um, the optical drive has died. Uh, this is a great way to get it working again and not have to worry about that. Anyway, happy gaming!